I'm really excited for this guest today. He is someone who has a completely different and super simple way of tapping into that inner knowing. If you've ever wondered what's next in your life, what you're supposed to be doing, you're trying to solve difficult problems. This guy has just an incredible process that is so, so simple. It sometimes feel like it shouldn't be that easy, but uh, I really hope you enjoy this one and I hope you find a ton of value in trying to apply this to your life. Hey guys, really excited to be talking with New York Times bestselling author of Thought Revolution, How to Unlock Your Inner Genius, speaker, ideation facilitator, and former banker and CEO. He had a recent TEDx talk, Unlocking the Brain's Hidden App, which explains a new approach to brainstorming. And he's been teaching at the Esalen Institute in a personal development workshop called Meet Your Better Half. Uh, please welcome Bill Donius. Thank you so much for being here, Bill. Sure, Ned. Great to see you. And I, I actually wanted to start off on, on how we met, because I just find that life has this funny way of throwing interesting people in my path. And, and you are on the top of the list of some of the more interesting, unique characters I've met. So I was at a, uh, well, we were both at a conference in New York City. I think you and I had been chatting about where I was getting stuck in my life. And you were like, hey, do you want to go try something kind of interesting? You want to do this non-dominant handwriting I was like, I have no idea what any of that even means, but yes. And I remember we were sitting on the corner of 34th and 8th on some rooftop bar overlooking the street. And I was writing what I thought was chicken scratch. And then we deciphered it. And it was basically like my inner voice guiding me through some relationship challenges, what I wanted to do with my life, who I want to be when I grow up. And I, and I can't remember the exact words, but something tells me the idea of me having my own voice was a big piece of that. And sitting here with you doing my podcast is like such a full circle moment. So I thank you for, in many ways, guiding me here to this and then being a participant as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I also remember that moment because it's, it's one of the things that really has excited me most about this work that I do is getting to be in those moments with individuals where they unlock something, especially in many cases where that have define them, kept them stuck sometimes for decades. So to be able to break through that in a, in a way that's uh, unorthodox and amazingly simple and easy and, and even profound in many ways is, is exciting for me. Yeah, it was very cool to witness. And I got to tell you, my skeptical mind was challenging that all the way until the moment where we really kind of picked out things on the page. And I was like, wow, that's not anything I would have allowed myself to even think or feel. So very cool to see that. And I'd love to, before we dive into what it is that you even do, I find it super interesting where you came from. And I'd love it if you would just kind of give us a little bit of, of a background of, you know, your upbringing professionally, where you started out and kind of leading into what was that first moment in your life where you're like, I made it, I'm successful. Okay, cool. Great question. Um, I would say I had the Forrest Gump experience of, of life and work and business. And that after graduating from business school at Tulane University, I really had a number of things that I was interested in. And, but then I quickly found that they typically, you know, they didn't work as well as I intended or I wasn't as interested. I was bored. So I moved on from healthcare sales to, public relations, to management consulting, to television production, uh, to retail food. And it w did all those things for 11 years before getting into banking. And, and then was in banking for, and something I, I guess I tried to avoid uh, in some ways, because it was my family's business and I wasn't that interested in doing it, but uh, that ended up being the most satisfying part of my career. I did that for 20 years. Uh, succeeded my father took the company public we did the that was a it went really well for for employees shareholders for everybody and then we sold the bank and and, and banking is basically over bank so we don't need you know thousands and thousands of banks in the united states so that was one of the realizations it's an overly competitive uh market but it, it and then i was able to uh move on from that to rebalance my life at age 50 and go into this space that I've been in the last uh, 14 years, helping people like deal with issues that come up and in their life where they're stuck and, and, or just potentially realizing their potential, helping them move through life in a way that is much more meaningful. So that, that's been a really satisfying 
time in my life. And it was, and, and it, it says, and frankly, probably most wouldn't say it, but it really overshadowed company and the, and the, the business successes were great. And I guess they propelled me and allowed me, I was financially blessed to be able to do this and kind of quit and go in this direction. But it's, it's been a great ride. What was the single moment that you feel like you really made it in a business context? I'm, I'm really curious where you're like, well, I really, I really did it. I suppose it was realizing the dream and uh, the many years of hard work and taking the company public and finding that that process worked out well and we were able to succeed for shareholders, employees, customers. It was a, a big success, I guess, growing the company eightfold and and doing really well for shareholders. And that was a, you know, a wonderful moment. And for me, I was lucky that it happened uh, earlier in life. So that was also a plus. I'm kind of wondering from the perspective of, you know, some people have these exits in a particular industry and then they stay in that industry and they keep doing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering for you, how much of that front half of your professional career was out of familial obligation or for some other reason, carrying a torch versus you chasing your deeper calling? That's a good question. I, I don't think there was a huge familial obligation because I essentially it was maybe the opposite was maybe true because I avoided uh, joining the bank for 11 years and just wanted to go out on my own. I also didn't want to be that son or grandson in a family business that is the know-it-all and is 21 years old. You know, So I feel like I needed some life lessons to to learn, but it was it was really a number of things coming together. I think I, I gained the wisdom of being out in the workplace, going to business school, being out there eleven years, and and really sensing that that some of my interests were aligning with what the company needed. And my father was getting older and closer to retirement, and we were very 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 different people. So I don't think I could have worked for him more than five years, which I did, but because we just saw the world differently. We were very good friends and, you know, I had a good relationship, but it was just uh, different, differing business philosophies. So that's actually pretty great to hear. I mean, I, I think a lot of the family business stories I've heard, like even my own, I mean, much of it was there to take care of my family. And part of my curiosity is, again, so you come out of this, this relationship with the bank, you have this big win, which again, I don't know how many people ever experienced taking their company public. So, I mean, that must've been such an extraordinary moment. And how long was it between that and this current clarity around what your next calling was? Did you already know what that was? Did you already have a sense of that? No, it was, it was about another 10 years. So took the company public at age 38 and then at age 48, after quitting in 20 years of hard labor, uh, it was, you know, I, I, they, the investment banker said, you know, work it. It's probably, you probably got five years and it's all going to be over. Because something will happen, you'll either buy or sell, or or there's you know have to leave, or whatever is going to happen. And so, by t at the end of twenty years of uh, of that kind of work at at a sixty seventy hour week pace, with you know we're talking to analysts and uh, PE firms, you know the and the institutional markets for ten years of that, I was a little burned out and. And so I went to Santa Fe and was on a retreat thinking about what's next and what the rest of my life, the purpose was. And it was in that retreat process using what I also had learned in therapy 10 years before at age 38, this uh, process of intuitive writing, right brain writing, ideation, uh, however you want to call it, that I took on that question and said, God, what do I want to do? And what came up for me was sounded at the time trite, it was help people. And I was like, oh, that, that's, that's, you know, sounds pretty good. Well, like how? And then I got, well, you need to consider teaching the methodology that you have personally used for these 10 years in your life and in business, you need to consider sharing that. And, and I was it's still again, like, like, how would that happen? It was like, write a book. And I was like, oh, write a book. That doesn't sound gr that great. It sounds like more work. And I'm trying to balance my life maybe a little bit more so uh but then that i realized in the in the in the following weeks that that registered with me and and that became sort of my north star and i decided to 
uh, essentially retire early at 50 and head in this direction. And again, I was fortunately financially able to do so, but it, it just, I, I realized there was a whole nother chapter of my life that I needed to go and do that also involved rebalancing because I, I didn't want to be working 60, 70 hour work weeks, um, you know, for the next 10 or 15 years or what have you. So you did feel, it sounds like you felt a little bit of resistance when this was starting to present the idea to you as it was starting to come through the filters. It's like the, you know, can, I don't know if I necessarily want to go down that road. What was, I, I love coming into these moments. Like what was that moment where you realized I have to pick up the sword and this is my calling. I must do this with my life. Well, it, that's a great question because it, it is like, you know, the slaying of the ego, right? How do you go from you know, the, the, a CEO job earning, you know, a lot and doing really well and being that guy, especially in a, in a net that St. Louis is a small town, but I, you know, had stature in St. Louis and the business community. I was down and, you know, I enjoyed the work itself. I enjoyed the customers. I enjoyed that whole experience. And so it, it did take some time. Uh, and, it, and I think the, the key to it was that I had learned to trust the intuition that I got from, in my parlance, from the right side of my brain, which I associate with the higher consciousness, that spiritual part of the brain, the problem solving part, uh, the part that we get those, that we get those messages that can be transformative in our lives. And whether solving a simple everyday problem or something really big, like what do I want to do with the rest of my life? I, I felt as though the weeks went on that that really resonated with me. So I started putting things in motion that made that so a couple of years later. And then, uh, you know, I, it wasn't like I was a, ever 100% confident, but I, I felt like there was a strong sense that 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 was my, that that was kind of my North Star and that it would work out and that that was my calling. And, and, it, and, then, and then I was... It vindicated, I guess, in the years after it, I did 200 interviews with people in the in the lead up to, and and as so doing the research to to be able to write that book on that topic that 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 really validated that I was on the right path because I saw even in those interviews that I was able to help people and that it was you know that it was useful and that even a a singular meetup of a hour and a half could really help someone get some insight about their life or a problem or an issue. So it, I, I saw the power in that. And I thought, wow, to be able to do this every day would be, would be wonderful to be able to make a difference, you know, do my small part and perhaps making the world a little bit better place. Cause I checked, I was felt lucky enough to check the financial box. And although not fortunate enough to have a jet, I'm sorry, or I would have been called you earlier, but it was enough to, it was enough to you know, have a good life and, and yeah. be really focused with intention. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. It's been a hard life without a jet. I know it's a bit of a slog, but it would have made things so much easier for me, you know, traveling to all these events that I have to go to. So, uh, so maybe th there is a, an idea that I have that I'm percolating with a small team. So who knows, maybe that'll, maybe that'll kick in and, and it'll be possible for is as they get older, and well, I want to travel more comfortably. So maybe, maybe yeah. that's still. Well, again, I definitely, I definitely know a guy who can help with that when the time comes. So you're the first call. Uh, yeah, fantastic. And, and you know, I think for people that are listening, again, I had the fortune of experiencing this firsthand, not even knowing what I was doing. How do you describe what you do for and with people? So I describe it as as a way of activating the neural pathways to the right side of the brain, and as is almost inconceivable as that sounds, uh, or um, and on, or unorthodox as that sounds. It's based in a Nobel Prize winning discovery that Roger Sperry made in, and was awarded its Nobel Prize in 1981 when they were looking at uh, patients through the years that uh, trying to understand brain function. And they were looking at how uh, specifically how to solve for epilepsy. And so they started cutting the corpus callosum which did uh, completely separate the two hemispheres, the left from the right. And they, they learned a lot about brain function. If you want to Google something interesting, if you, if you Google split brain patients, you know, 
cut split corpus callosum, you'll you'll see those patients struggling uh, to hear in response to the command, grab the pen. You'll see the left hand and the right hand of the same patient, like as if it were two different people. So the wow. the the amazing. Uh, and whether this is, you know, that now science has, you know, advanced in the years since 81 and people believe a lot of different things and some even have potentially have debunked this and they say whether it's metaphorically true or scientifically valid, I'm, I generally suggest to people just try and judge for yourself. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't work, great. Try something else. Uh, but I, I have about, and they, and the many people I've taken this to from huge global companies like Hitachi and Kawasaki to um, small nonprofits to medium national nonprofits to workshops around the world, it works for about 90% of the people that do this. Because if you're an extreme type A, it may be difficult because you have to be willing to let go and trust the process and allow this to happen because you have to get your mind into that flow state because it's really a thinking tool much more than a much more so than a handwriting tool because it's still i can show you my handwriting 26 years later it's still messy you know so it's it's really about learning how to think differently so as you're talking i mean a bunch of questions come up and again i'm a, I'm a layman when it comes to neuroscience and how the brain works what i think i hear you saying is on some level that, you know, what happened for me that day that we sat down was I was using the dominant part of my brain to try to solve my problems, which is, I guess, the left side is what I'm doing to, to do a lot of my rational problem solving. And you gave me access to my creative part of my brain or the other side of my brain that I may not have predominantly used or I'm not listening to or something to that effect. But you gave me a pathway to it without me even knowing what I was doing. Yeah, and scientists would say that we, and, and I did a lot, I've worked with a team of 11 psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists in the writing of the book because I didn't want to write something at, after my whole business career that was, you know, malarkey and be, you know, laughed at. So I was very careful to make sure there was scientific standing. And then one of those, uh, Right, guys who studied with, uh, whose mentor studied with uh, Roger Sperry at, 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 was at Harvard at the time. And he actually opined, read the whole book, uh, commented, even added a couple pages into the book. Um, so scientists know we use all of our brain all of the time. So I think this is like the difference between maybe a, a good analogy would be between if you've always been a runner. And then you, you decide to swim as a way to supplement your workout. It's, it's, it's your body's going to respond differently, right? So it's, it's, it's a, just a different function. In this case, it's what it, what it feels like to me all these years later is that we're activating the brain in a different manner. So if, for just a moment, if we can just get that activation to occur, to, to bounce over to that right side of the brain, which is known to house those functions of intuition, dreaming, problem solving, creativity. So all that good stuff is there. It's sort of like we have to, maybe using that sword analogy, we have to just pierce through for a second to, to get it. And then we can run back to the way we typically think and operate. And interestingly, though, the the most of us, 92% of us in the United States are right-handed, which is controlled by the left side of the brain. And the left side of the brain controls uh, and is known for, you know, math, math, mathematics and reasoning and linear thinking, logical thinking, uh, speech, you know, all those things that, that put food on the table, gas in the car. And, and also, you know, I think can be the definition of the box in, in many cases. So it's, it's, no, it's no accident that think outside the box is the most overused business hyperbole because we all say it, but we don't necessarily know how to do it. You know, we just do the same thing, kind of maybe trying to do it quicker, faster, better. But uh, so it, it really is hard to get outside that comfort zone. And this process does it, I, in my estimation, about as well as any. And has also been applied to the art world. Drawing on the right side of the brain it was written in the 80s and it still is a fantastic process for those who want to learn how to draw better. And then that is basically you've got to get your brain out of the way to be able to draw better because 
most of us don't draw any better than we did at age five. You know, so if we're trying to draw an image of a person in a chair, it's it's not going to be very good. So it's the brains getting in the way because all that we know about the chair, the person, the age is conflicting with just drawing the damn thing, you know, so we don't see it in the way that we could otherwise. And then uh, a woman that I studied with and, and was my mentor, Dr. Lucia Capacchione, wrote Recovery of Your Inner Child. And so she helped launch the whole inner child movement in psychology. So in psychology, this versions of this process have been used for decades and decades and decades. They typically refer to it as intuitive writing. And when patients, you know, have something where it's not working any other way, which was the case for me and my therapist gave me Lucia's book and when I was 38, and it really helped crack the code of where, where I was stuck. And I'd already spent a year and I was saying to my therapist, Hey, we need to speed this up. You know, I mean, I, I, I just have a busy job. I mean, I can't come here every week and not see major progress. So Lucia's book really helped me break break through, but it's not for everybody. You know, if you haven't suffered uh, some sort of abuse, it, it's in, in earlier in life or whenever it's, it's, it's not, it's a tough read and you're going to put it down oh. fast. So my thought was, what about all the rest of us in the world who need help with garden variety problems, you know, how to improve the profitability of their company, how to get, improve the, a relationship that hasn't been working well, how to make the team collaborate better. Um, how to be a better human, you know, how to, uh, what's your highest and best purpose? All these big questions in life are, I found are better served by activating the brain differently and getting essentially what feels like a second opinion. Only the best part is it's not from a friend or a treasured professor, maybe even, or a psychologist, but, but from yourself, you know, it's getting this wisdom from this higher self is uh, higher consciousness is what it feels like. So I'm, I'm curious to know if, you know, how does this relate to fulfillment as you're talking about this? And again, I'm someone that's mostly solved problems in my life through my rational mind. And I'm really now kind of in the introspective phase of, you know, I, I'm after a feeling I'm not after external conditions. I think I've only recently made sense of that. That actually doesn't matter how many whatevers I have or how much money I have or where I live or any of that stuff. It is a state of fulfillment, peace, happiness, joy that I'm looking for. How does this process relate to that? Great question. And I think it, it relates uh, very directly to your purpose and what your meaning uh, for life is. Like, why are you here? What are you here to do? Or what are you here uh, that you need to do next? Because maybe you've done, you know, 15 different things. And, you know, what's next? What's next for you to realize with the rest of your life in this gift that we have? You know, how do you make the most of it? And in and, and, and my parlance, I think that the right side of the brain is so closely connected to our soul's journey that it and, and tapping into that higher consciousness is is the most direct and, in and, and fact, kind of easiest also way to go there and get what we need to get to get the self-awareness to know why we're here, what our journey's about, uh, what's left to do, uh, why we're stuck, what we need to work on. You know, all those big kind of existential questions are, uh, we can get help accessing, and if you will, outsourcing in some ways, maybe those uh, thoughts uh, to the right side of our brain to get that wisdom that we're seeking. And as you were doing this, I mean, is that what, you had come up for you and that's why you felt called to do this work because it did kind of answer that big deep search question like the Viktor Frankl question right it's it's we're all looking for that meaning yeah absolutely because I thought it was to help finance people's dreams you know which was great as a banker and I was doing that in spades increasingly you know more and more helping as the bank grew many 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 more people and that was satisfying and it was great and creating a great employment environment for employees. We were voted best place to work in St. Louis. So that was fulfilling, uh, doing well for shareholders. That was fulfilling. And, and so there was a part of me, it was like, okay, great. I'm checking all the boxes. Like what else is there? And so it was in that retreat that I posed that, that question to myself, like, okay, what is my highest and best purpose? What, what else have I have uh, left to do? 
you know, if you if you've been able to check the box, fortunately uh, financially, then it gives you the freedom to go off and do either what you really want to do or what you need to do or what you're called to do. You know, that is that's fantastic. But I found you don't have, you know, sometimes that's the excuse to the lie we tell ourselves is that, oh, I can't do anything until I've attained this economic success. Well, I've seen in the workshops I've led at, S- at the Essel Institute and other places over the years that that now uh, oftentimes when we find our bliss, we find our passion, that can also lead to great financial success. So we may be trapped in a job that we hate. And no, it's no wonder we're not doing well at it because we hate it. And so it isn't until we leave that and, and pursue where our skill sets, talents, and, and purpose align that we also achieve the financial success we want to achieve. Is there a particular story about someone you've worked with that really, that one you can share and two, it is one of your prouder accomplishments? Yeah, there, the, yeah, there, I mean, there's a flood of, of things that come to mind. I, I guess the most recent because it's the freshest and it was also in the it, it, one of was in the, in the, uh, a recent, podcast that I um, did with the Essel Institute, Voices of Esalen, was of uh, the workshop participant who was um, working and had been working, was trained to work as an oncology nurse and had, you know, a- achieved a high level and great status in that role and was doing really well, but unfulfilled in the work and really did a deep dive to understand why that was the case. And figured out that she really wanted to spend her time caring for the patient rather than administering the drugs and and then and then figured out a pathway to do that and so she did all that in the period of a, a few months and that was last year there's also a uh, a 27 ish year old who was in a job where he was doing really well financially but he just knew that that you know, he, he, the golden handcuffs were kind of on and he was well regarded in the company doing really well, but it wasn't really helping him achieve his passion of being an entrepreneur or learning how to be his own boss or, or and so he took the big risk and jumped out into a much more entrepreneurial opportunity and understood what that meant, why he was doing it and felt good about making a, a huge change, uh, in his life and career and taking the risk and so doing so. Um, and then there are some that have had really successful, there was the, uh, the gentleman who was a Mensa member and had been fired five times in his career and his wife referred him to me because um, she was tired of him getting fired and having their whole life be interrupted and he was able to unlock uh, why it was with him that he progressed. And it was typically when he was directly reporting to the CEO that that would happen. And it wouldn't happen prior, but he unlocked the reason. And the CEO was a proxy for the father figure that, it, that, that he had. And the father that he had, he had completely erased and forgotten uh, something that happened at age 14 where it was a pretty minor thing in the scheme of things, but that comment uh, from his father then uh, was very triggering, uh, you know, uh, decades later in life and was interrupting his career. And just the awareness of that singular comment it, it allowed him to understand the impact it was having on his life. So th- that's a, a few, I guess, independent kind of examples. And I, I think the part of it that is quite interesting to me is we're kind of in this world of everyone has these expensive solutions to problems and these massively complex things. It just seems like such a simple tool at the end of the day. And, and and I'm wondering, is it, is it the kind of thing where someone could just learn it for themselves and do it on their own? Or do they really need to lean on a facilitator like you? No, and uh, absolutely the former. In fact, the reason that I wrote the book through the lens that I wrote it after those 200 interviews which I framed it sort of as through the lens of the lies we tell ourselves. And then this process is essentially a truth detector helping us break through where we're held back. So I identified eight different lies that seem common amongst those 
200 people that I interviewed and the objective was to make it, uh, you know, and, and truly a self-help book that you could help yourself by reading it. And there are 54 questions and, and working through it. So one of the most satisfying things about the work actually is to hear from people who I'll meet somewhere, somewhere in the world and, or who will reach out and write to me through my website and will share that they did this work, you know, six years ago, 10 years ago, whenever, and, and the impact it had on their life. Um, so yes, it, it, and for, and then there are some that are not able to learn that way. And so they attend workshops, which is great. You know, that's more immersive. The workshop at Esalen is a, a whole weekend leading one at the modern elder Academy in Baja, Mexico in May, and that's a whole week. So people learn in, in differing ways. And I'm, realizing also that I experimented last year with a whole digital hybrid class that I'm thinking I probably need to do that. It was kind of forced on me during COVID where we couldn't be in person. So I developed videos that with clients, um, big corporate clients to, to continue to do the work by Zoom. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's the good news is it is very relatable and easy to learn and easier for some perhaps, but yes, that's, it's a, it's a truly a, a process that is efficient and effective. You know, as you're talking, I'm kind of hearing some patterns in what you shared is that it seems like you're one of those people that has throughout your life gone within to allow yourself to steer to the next thing that felt right for you. I don't know if it was in your nervous system or in your consciousness or what it is, but it's kind of cool to see that after navigating so many different jobs that you talked about, choosing to go back to the family business, having success there, finding your way to this thing that as you talk about it, it's like, how did you even figure that out, right? It's amazing that it was like this well of wisdom within you that you've been able to tap into. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me at all to hear that this is what you help people do. It sounds like that is your innate gift is you've always been able to go within yourself, even if you've resisted it and you're helping people get access to the same thing, which I just think is such a cool calling. Well, you know, it's probably a very polite way of saying I'm an impatient person. But, but That's good, I, too. I've not, I've not thought of it that way before, but now no, I think there may be something there because I've always felt like I was able to take what was my Achilles heel in, in intimacy and relationships and, and what I learned in therapy and, and overcome that Achilles heel and then that the, the, the process that I learned then has become my superpower, but I, I really feel like my life really changed in my late thirties learning this because I, I, I was somewhat adrift, somewhat impatient, somewhat bothered, some, you know, somewhat a seeker and searching and, and just, and, and I guess I was unwilling to accept, uh, boredom or unwilling to accept scenarios, work scenarios, especially where I was felt like I wasn't contributing or doing something meaningful. And if I was just kind of a, on that uh, hamster wheel of sorts, I felt like, uh, you know, my life's too short. I don't want to do this, at, uh, you know, for a long time. What's the dream now? I mean, you've, you've had incredible success in multiple areas and mo multiple domains. You've had incredible impact on people. What do you dream about now? What, do you, what, what drives you through the day? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question too. I, I've been thinking about this in the last um, year or so. And, and I, I think it's, you know, being open-minded to continue to learn and being uh, aware of what else is out there and what other possibilities exist. A new opportunity has opened up in the, in the whole grief arena. And uh, I've been invited to, uh, I've led a national webinar and then I'm going to be one of the speakers at a, a grief retreat in Connecticut this summer. So it's helping people understand that intersection, you know, of life and death. Uh, and do we survive bodily death? You know, where did, how do we grieve? Why are we grieving? How can we turn channel that into something that's useful, um, helpful so that that's of interest to me. Um, uh, also, hopefully finding a, a way to somewhat institutionalize this process so it doesn't sort of end with me, you know, uh, that, that I've already have a number of people that 
that I've trained to do this work that in, in various forms. Uh, but I, I think there could be some sort of a digital course that would, you know, exist uh, out there that would be able to really build at great, much greater scale, uh, teaching this out into the world because it's, you know, I've been happy to go at the pace that I've gone at and, you know, I haven't really looked at it as a, as a money-making thing as much as it is a, you know, uh, a passion affirming project. So, but I, I, I don't think those two things are independent. You know, I, I think I can get my passion out there more would be satisfying and rather than doing it, you know, just dial it up on a, on a bigger scale. So I'm looking at those kinds of opportunities because it, it works really equally well in the workplace. Uh, so these big corporate teams that I work with, uh, you know, in some cases a decade later now still use this process and they're managerial meetings and their processes, especially when they're stuck or have a problem. So, and then they, and then the other uh, satisfying part has been when they've used it at work and it works, they've integrated into their personal lives and they used it to help find, you know, why they're uh, depressed or upset at something or why something else wasn't, isn't working as well. So it, it really deserves to live in, you know, both the workplace and in the personal development world. So it's, how to continue to drive that forward, I guess, is the is the other part that I'm thinking about. I mean, it's incredible to hear just someone to help us process the human experience, right? I mean, really, especially the, I think, the death conversation, which is, and I think a lot of people think that it only surfaces later in life, but more and more I'm realizing how many of us are trying to avoid the topic trying, you know, trying not to face the topic or dealing with even unprocessed death experiences from childhood, right? Losing grandparents or parents or pets or whatever that is. So uh, I just, I don't know, it's just been awesome to watch what you're doing and to hear more of your story. And it's just such a gift that you're giving to the world. So I can definitely recommend what helps uh, amplify my uh, path and down this, in this direction is the, uh, the book I've since met her at Esalen. Um, she's a New York Times uh, reporter and took a journalist's approach to the topic of death and wrote uh, the Netflix. It's a Netflix series. Wrote a, a great book uh, that I highly recommend, titled "Surviving Death." And the Netflix series is by the same name. It's it, when you. It's it's really almost impossible to read her book or watch the series and not come away with an understanding that we do survive death and that there is more to it. We're not just in the ground and it's over, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's, so it's really fascinating. Well, I think kind of to sum it all up, what, what is so cool about what you're sharing to me is that life really is like a Disney movie where like the answers are inside of us, right? It's, it just takes that courage to believe our own intuition or to make the space or to learn the skill of being able to tap into that. And, uh, you know, again, I'm just, I'm grateful to have the time with you and be able to talk about this. And I, I hope people that are listening really take this to heart and try the exercise. Cause again, I was very skeptical, very skeptical the first time. I'm like, this is silly. I don't see how this is going to do anything. There's expensive, difficult methods to solve this problem. Why would this work? And, uh, I did find just so much value and, you know, really unearthing things about my relationships, unearthing things about my path and my life that I was unclear about and resisting, mostly because it was fear-based. And I would say that what you did with me allowed me to answer a question from beyond my own fear. I really was like tapping into my heart, my courage, my gut. That's what that allowed. So I, I highly recommend you guys take a moment to try it. Just check out Bill's book. Uh, I mean, th there's so much to recap from this. I, I, I really feel like the major sentiment, though, is that you already have the answer. You may not think you have the answer. Uh, and even if you don't, there's a way to get there. And that's really what Bill's work is about, is uh, really learning to do something that is so not Western. It's to trust yourself. It's to trust yourself and not need to go to, you know, therapists and doctors and career counselors and all these people to tell you what you should do. There's really an opportunity for you to find out within yourself what you're really called to do, what you came in to do. And uh, I hope that for all of you. And Bill, just thank you so much. My recommendations are again, check out Bill's book, Thought Revolution, How to Unlock Your Inner Genius. If you're curious to really get some face time with Bill, you could check out Modern Elder Academy. He'll be down there in May. You could also check out the Esalen Institute, and he's also got an event there in May as well, I think from the 5th to the 7th. 
And uh, man, I'm going to see if I could squeeze some of that into my calendar. Otherwise, I'm just going to hunt you down wherever you are in the country just to get some catch up time. And then it's it's still in formation, but I'm likely uh, leading a uh, workshop in New York City on July 12th for uh, specifically for creatives, uh, writers, directors, um, actors, and, and and the experience with them just kind of anecdotally has been so positive through the years that the idea was to like really create something specifically for them to help them so that that may happen but that'll Amazing. be on my try to sleep and so that'll be posted there williamdownings.com fantastic well again thank you so much for the time this is really lovely yeah, thank you and i appreciate who you are in the world how you show up in the world and and i'm delighted that you're doing this getting the message out there and and helping people kind of uh awaken to their own superpowers and, and to what's important in life so kudos to you man Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed.